Well, it's not as entertaining for us. We're not at Merkel's like we were last Friday, but Trent and LaShawn back to together today for Locked On Hawkeyes as we break things down. Any hope for this Iowa offense to get things turned around as they prepare for Rutgers? You are Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. I'm Trent Condon. He's LaShawn Daniels, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first at listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's Jace, J A S E Medical.com. LaShawn, good to see you. And Good to meet you in person last week. We had a lot of fun with that one uh, over at Merkel's, getting ready for the matchup in Wrigleyville. Really good time there, and uh, good to see you again. How you doing? Yeah, doing great. Doing great. Last week was pretty fun, uh, you know, getting out, meeting you in person, uh, interacting with all the fans over the weekend. It was definitely, definitely a great time. So uh, your experience as a former player, you had mentioned that had a bunch of people, former teammates, and just Iowa alum I that were kind of going to be there uh, what the experience was you I've talked about it here throughout the week what the experience was like you in the town that you live in now in Chicago yeah it was great um you know everywhere at first of all everywhere I went um there was always someone who recognized me uh whether it was fans or players uh you know chatted up a little bit even um you know some northwestern people uh northwestern uh former northwestern players uh I ran into who you know I uh, teamed up with in the NFL, so I was able to connect with them too. So just overall, just overall the weekend, thought it was great to you know talk to some people who really you have I haven't talked to in a in great great deal of time. So being able to sit there and and enjoy a uh, kind of a football game that we watched. I mean, <laughs> over the week, I mean, not going to sugarcoat it. Obviously, there was it wasn't the most entertaining uh, game, but it had its, had its moments, and you know, overall, it was just just a great weekend. It really was. Had such a good time and really enjoyed it. Great catching up with you and and all the fans. We had people stopping by at Merkel's, and I was there Saturday as well. Just a really, really cool experience, and, and happy that we could enjoy it. It felt like a bowl game, and uh, maybe a little bit more because this team still now, with what was happening on Saturday, is everybody in the Big Ten West falling. I went now in control once again of their own destiny to win this division title. And three games to go. I believe that Rutgers is certainly the most talented team that they're going to face here the remaining season and maybe the second best team that they faced uh, after Penn State this season, which is crazy to think. But you know, this is a good Rutgers team. This is a Rutgers team that can run the football good defensively. They do not allow explosive plays. And kind of my theory of the day and something I wanted to run past you is we know this team is not going to be great offensively, but I kind of like the game plan that they had on Saturday. It didn't work. And when they got to, you know, the 30, 35 yard line, they just kept shooting themselves in the foot. But I think that's kind of the scheme and the game plan they got to go with going forward. I mean, simplifying things so much for Deacon, making it as incredibly easy for him. I liked what I saw on Saturday. Crazy to say in a 10 7 game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, they did a good job of controlling the football game. Um, obviously, you know, limiting turnovers, that's a pretty big. Uh, part of having success, um, and I think there was just the, the one down in the in the red zone. But for the most part, yeah, I thought they did a solid job of controlling the game. And yeah, you hit it right on the right on the head. I mean, it was very very basic offense. A lot of almost what seemed like day one install type stuff. See, so they threw a little bit of wrinkles in there. I mean, we saw uh, Cooper come in out on offense for a couple of plays, which was, which was uh, fun to see. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it was very, very simple offense, limit the amount of, uh, mistakes and just kind of play that field position game, which is see a little bit of what they've been doing all year, but I think they simplified it even more to put in a position where, you know, Deacon's not going to have to really put the ball in, in harm's way. Um, and then I see when you got to the end of the football game and they have to run a quick two minute drill to get into position to, uh, 
uh, you know, kick game winning field goal. They were able to do that. Um, so that was that was encouraging to see. Um, and hopefully that that game is going to allow them to continue to build off of that, because, again, you 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 mentioned it. Rutgers is probably going to be the second best team that they've played up to this point in the season. And Rutgers is a really good football team. They've played a lot of their um, tough opponents extremely, extremely tight. And I would expect that to continue. You mentioned uh, Cooper DeGene getting out there for a couple of plays, and it, it's a part of it. Yeah, we love to see him out there. Iowa needs any help they can get offensively, but you know, Kirk mentioned it earlier this week on Tuesday, just trying to almost walk that fine line, not trying to get him out there too much, knowing that you know, what can happen if he's injured. Well, we saw it last year against Nebraska. It was so debilitating to that team defensively, and all of a sudden your elite defense isn't elite anymore if Cooper DeGene is out. And walking that fine line, what would be a good number? Is it, you know, a, a package that you come in for a drive here in the first half, another maybe in the third quarter? Would that be something that would make sense to you as you're kind of preparing for this one and knowing that points are going to be at a premium again this week? Yeah, uh, I think it's definitely around there, probably around, you know, maybe that, I don't know, five to eight play range, like just something where you put him out there and just makes the defense kind of think about, uh, you know, the potential of him uh, getting the football because again, he can impact the play with him, just with him not even getting the football, whether you're just sending him in on a motion or even if you're just lining him up out there, because it's something else that the defense has to account for. But yeah, you don't want to have him on offense all the time. You just, you just don't want to do it because Again, it's 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 really too risky for your football team knowing how valuable he is on the defensive side of the football. And I know that they're getting healthier on on the back end, but um, there's a reason why he's a starter, and you know the people behind them aren't right. I mean, at the end of the day, like there's a reason why those guys are starters. And when you're at the the type of caliber player that he is, it's going to be practically impossible to replace him if something does happen. So. Um, knowing how good he is on defense and how good he is on special teams, you want to limit it and do things that necessarily keep him out of harm's way. So if you are going to run plays for him on offense that he does get the ball, try to position it where he doesn't have to, where he's going to limit it, uh, limit the amount of contact he's going to take or, you know, obviously just keep him uh, from getting the ball entirely just uh, there when I think about adding him to the offensive side of the football. So, yeah, it's definitely a fine line you're going to want to, of balance on and I think that they did a solid job of it um last Saturday and I kind of want to see them sprinkle it in a little bit more maybe not just in one quarter or one specific drive but you know kind of sprinkle it in throughout the game just to continue make making the opposing defense have to think more well last week we saw grumpy Kirk Ferentz we heard it after the game he was not too pleased to be playing in a football stadium what a, I want to get LaShawn's thoughts on what it's like when Kirk's a little grumpy around the football offices and what it's like for a football player when he kind of have that feeling. We're going to talk about that. Also make our picks presented by FanDuel. We'll do that as we continue. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Trenton LaShawn back with you one time here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Make sure to check out SiriusXN if you're out and about on the game on Saturday. You can catch it there with the hometown broadcast from Gary Dolphin. And uh, always enjoy that. You, speaking of uh, XM and, of course, here locally on the radio did you ever get the uh, post game awards? You get to talk to Dolphin Eddie after the game and and have those guys as you're sitting down in the locker room. Yeah, yeah, I did it. I did it a few times. Uh, it was a good time. 
a good time talking with those guys. Uh, and obviously, you 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 don't ever really want to do media, but you want to do media like that because you know that you got a pretty good game. So you know you're probably feeling pretty good yourself, about yourself at that at that point in time. So yeah, yeah, definitely had my uh, fair share of that for sure. Well, leading into the Northwestern game, of course, we had the firing of Brian Ferentz staying on through the end of the season. We knew that Kirk was going to be emotional with that. We're talking about his son, for crying out loud. And and we also know the connection that he has to his coaches. I mean, they're not all best buddies, but these guys work incredibly close together, tons of hours together. And that's going to be impactful one way or the other, regardless of if it's somebody like that, right? That is obviously his son. But a post-game press conference on Saturday evening, hearing Kirk and not happy about playing at Wrigley Field. He, he was asked uh, earlier in the week about that. He was all all grumbly about it. You can tell Kirk's fired up. And when he's fired up, we get something on the media side of things. So how about you guys as players? Going back to your time when you say, oh, boy, coach is in one, right? He's he, he's in a mood right now. What was it like? And what is it walking on eggshells? Just kind of your perspective as a former player. Uh, sometimes you are. Um, and usually that that energy like will start like first thing in the morning, which is crazy. It's like, it's like, you know, seven, seven a.m. in the morning in a team meeting. And, you know, you can just feel that energy already, you know, coming off and you're like, oh, the day hasn't even started yet. <laughs> and we're at this and, and we're getting this type of energy. And um, then like, especially like if it's a padded day at practice and we've got like, um, whether it's uh, nine on seven or we've got one-on-one -on -one blocks, like it's, like it's definitely something that you feel that that energy coming from uh coach Ferentz and like he wants his players to kind of play up to, to that type of energy as well so those periods end up being a little bit more intense than what they might uh usually be uh but we we know that that's obviously a good thing he's trying to get us uh ramped up and uh you know really kind of in that same uh state of mind to go out there and you know, play with a little bit of chip on your shoulder, play a little bit, a bit of angry on, on Saturday. And, you know, obviously it kind of starts early in the week and then it ramps up, uh, you know, as you get through the rest of the game week. And so you get to Saturday, you get to get kickoff time and, you know, you're ready to go and you're ready to ready to hit someone. So, yeah, it's definitely something that it, you, you feel that energy and it uh, pretty, pretty early in the week. And then it kind of just, and it just carries over and it just snowballs as you, continue throughout the week. And I think the, the players and the team typically respond really, really well to that. One final thing on the game coming up tomorrow with Rutgers, and we talked about a little bit of, of some of the parts to the game. This offensive line is incredibly banked up. We saw Rusty Feth leave the game for a long time. He had to come back in because of the under, other injuries. Logan Jones goes out. We'll see about him. I thought Ellsbury played pretty well uh, in his place at the center position. Richmond's banged up. They just have all kinds of injuries right now along that offensive line. And, and with that, how debilitating is that? Trying to come up with some kind of game plan, knowing that even if the guys are going to make it a go, you're looking at probably playing some backups up there. The chances of the offensive line being able to play, you know, 50, 60 snaps are incredibly low. How much more difficult, what's already difficult with all the other injuries, doesn't make it when your offensive line's banged up? Yeah, it's tough. It's definitely a struggle. And um, it doesn't help that we have all the other injuries on the offensive side of the football as well. Cause I, so I think back to, you know, that 2015 season and like in the middle of the year there, like there was a point in time where offensively, like we were down bad, extremely like with injuries. I mean, like there was a point in time, I think we had like three backups in on the offensive line. I think that might've actually been the Illinois game um, where we had, you know, we had James playing tackle in that game and obviously right. he's an inside offensive mm -hmm. lineman. Um, so uh, when you get to a situation like that, it's you, you guys, you got to simplify the offense uh, extremely uh, like extremely a lot because now these guys, they haven't been playing as much, um, you know, especially as a unit, you know, the offensive line is a, one of those position groups where everyone has to be on the exact same page, or usually it's going to end up being a tackle for loss or a sack and not a successful play. So uh, you definitely have to keep everything simple and, now, obviously, they have a week of game planning. They know they're going to get an idea of kind of what the, the group that they end up sending out there, uh, what type of plays that they like, and they're probably going to try to lean on those things. And it's probably going to end up coming back to really what we mentioned at the beginning of this pod is a bunch of that day one install type, type, type of stuff that, 
you know, maybe they'll throw a little bit of wrinkles here and there, maybe with the formations or, or with motions, but it's going to be probably very, very simple for them and simple in the pass protection as well. So a lot of that responsibility of cleanup in the, in the pass protection game is probably going to end up falling, falling on the running back since right now that's probably going to be, that's your most <laughs> veteran group, I would say right now. I mean, like when you yeah, think yeah. about it, like they're going to, they're, that's going to be the group that's going to have to help pick up the slack. So um, it's never easy when you're dealing with offensive linemen injuries because first off, it's very, very difficult to find good offensive linemen uh, to begin with. And now when you have to go to, you know, maybe your, your second or even third string guys, it's, it's not an easy task. So uh, it's definitely going to have to rely on, you know, that, that day one install stuff and being consistent there and helping these guys stay ahead of the chain so they don't have to get in those tough, uh, you know, obvious passing down situations um, where typically where, uh, you know, backup offensive linemen uh, tend to struggle. Well, Sean, I know a little tight on time today, so just quickly here in about 30 seconds before we get into your picks, the Caleb Johnson situation, an odd one. Uh, Kirk said on Tuesday that it was a coach's decision. Sounded like maybe he was ill last week and maybe he didn't put in the practice time, even being ill that they wanted. I, I'm kind of reading between the lines on that one, but just a quick hit on that. Yeah, I don't know. It's very, honestly, it's weird. <laughs> like, I have no, I no, nothing else to really say about it. I mean, Obviously, he came into the year, uh, you know, undisputed starter. And then I see he was out for a little bit. Sean comes in and started playing well. But even though Caleb has been back, like, we really haven't seen much of him. And they're not really, you know, uh, you know, the walls at, at, at Kinnick. They're not, they're not letting anything out, no information out. So you're never really going to actually know. I just think it's a weird situation. And I would love to have an idea of what's going on. But. Yeah, I have no idea, and I don't want to speculate anything uh, there. So. All right, LaShawn, time to make our picks for the week. It's presented by FanDuel, and we will get into those as we continue here. Locked on Hawkeyes. We spend a lot of time talking together. We celebrate the wins. We get frustrated by the losses. And today, I want to chat a little bit more about something a little more personal. I just learned that you can get a one-year supply on ED medications. You realize what that means? Well, bring on extended travel, the next natural disaster, or something that's always huge, supply chain issues. You are covered. You don't have to worry about whether or not you can refill your generics of Things like Viagra, Cialis, and this is possible because of our friends at Jace Medical. Right now, go to jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on your daily medications. Remember to use the promo code LOCKDOWN at checkout for a discount as well. This customer had this to say about Jace Medical. I am thankful for this service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut Pills in half to have. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. If you or someone you'd love want to get the peace of mind by having a year supply of any daily med that they have, you can go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. Again, remember to use the promo code locked on for $20 off your purchase. That's at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. Trent LaShawn back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. All right, LaShawn, time to get into it. Our picks of the week, and we kick things off with the big neuter. It is Michigan State going to Penn State. Wolverines favored by four in the hook. Yeah, going to be a great game. Uh, it's obviously going to be a really, really good environment. Uh, it's a shame that it's uh, really not a night game here. I really think that this is a missed opportunity there. Um, and obviously everything surrounding Michigan kind of gives me a little bit of pause of uh, rolling with the Wolverines, but I just think that they're such a really good football team. I know that they haven't played a tough schedule to this point, but they have been dominant every single week. And I really honestly kind of see that continuing against Penn State this week. So, so you're going Wolverines. Yeah. Wolverine, Wolverine going with Michigan and going with Harbaugh as long as he makes it. We'll see uh, later today <laughs> if anything is handed down. Uh, I am on Penn State. I love this team coming into the season. Chop Robinson's coming back. That defensive line has been impactful in Michigan. They haven't seen anything like this. I, I think it's a field goal game, so I'll grab the four and a half and take the Nittany Lions. Pick number two, we go to our run of SEC battles and start with Old Miss going to Georgia. The handicap is simple. Georgia, when they have their heads screwed on straight, they dominate teams. I think they will against Lane Kiffin here. I'll lay the 11 and take Georgia. Yep, same thing here. <laughs> I know uh, last week they played uh, – was it Mizzou played them tough? Yep. Um, 
And I think Mizzou is actually a really underrated football team yeah. at this point in time of the year. And um, I see Ole Miss has done a lot of good things, but yeah, give me the give me the dogs. I'm I'm all aboard that that bandwagon right now. Uh, speaking of Mizzou, that is our next game as they play host to Tennessee. Teams battling in the SEC East should be a good one here. Volunteers favored by two, Lashawn. Yeah, I love. Mizzou in this one. I really do. I think that they've done an extremely good good job the entire fo- football season, especially offensively. And I see that continuing this week, even though, you know, Tennessee is a, a solid team uh, and they do a really good job running the football. But I just like the way the way Mizzou is playing right now. So uh, the one handicap that I come into in this one is, is their slot receiver for Mizzou, Luther Burton. He got hurt last week. He's an absolute stud. I mean, he might give Marvin Harrison Jr. a run for his money as the best wide receiver in college football. And because of his status, not knowing how injured he is, I'm going to lay the two points here and take Tennessee. Pick number four, let's go to Alabama as they travel to Lexington to take on Kentucky. The Crimson Tide are favored by 11. They're figuring it all out. Everything's going their way. I don't want to say a letdown spot. Yeah, letdown spot here. I'll grab the points. Give me it a sleepy 11 a.m. Central kickoff time. Give me Kentucky getting 11 as they grind out an ugly cover. See, I can see this game starting off slow. I can see it. But as I've said, I told you this last week, I've been on the Bama bandwagon as well. Ever since that, that USF game, they've been an entirely different football team and have really just started choking teams out in the second half. Mm-hmm. And I see that continuing with – how good they are in the run game and how strong that their defense is. Uh, I, I like Bama a lot. Going with Bama. All right, we wrap things up as we do each and every week with the Iowa game. Hawkeye's currently a one point favorite. The total uh, sits right now at FanDuel at 28 and a half, a historic low in this one. And everybody's betting the under. Finally, people are jumping aboard on the under trade. We don't play totals here. We play the point spread. Hawkeye's favored by one. What do you got, LaShawn? Uh, LaShawn? Yeah, so. Um, it's an interesting game. I think Rutgers is a really, really good football team, and they've done a lot of great things this year. But the fact is, I feel like with the line being as tight as it is and, you know, playing at Kinnick, uh, I feel like Rutgers is going to fall into the trap of playing Iowa's type of football game. And because of that, um, that's where I give Iowa the edge here, and I'm going to go with the Hawks because they're going to play strong defense. They're going to play strong special teams. And – Something about that, especially when it gets to November, that November, this time of year, that's when Iowa's style of football really shines. So give me the Hawks in this. Going with the Hawks. I am on the other side. Give me Rutgers. And I don't know. The offense has got to catch up to them at some point. Like I said, I think this is the second best team that they face. And because of that, I am going to go with Rutgers. Those are our picks of the week presented by FanDuel. LaShawn, hope you're right. I'm wrong this week, certainly on the (laughs) Iowa game. And we will talk again next week. Have a great time. I know you got to run to a meeting. We'll talk again soon. Yep, sounds good. Go Hawks. That's LaShawn Daniels. I'm Trent Condon. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. We'll be back with you tomorrow with an instant reaction podcast after the game against Rutgers.